I'm an author of an online course. I've shown people that can give me five million dollars. Good job for 10 months. Okay. He's allowed. He's stealing the lessons exactly. learned. And actually <laughs> Hi, you're listening to Data Room, a podcast where we build Team GPT in public. My name is Ilya, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Team GPT. I'm here with Ivan Vapsarov, who is the founder of PM Peer. Hi, Ilya. Thanks a lot for inviting me and for the chance to learn more about your startup. And this is uh, a place where we actually can meet and uh, discuss the, the topic from two perspectives. So you are the entrepreneur, the CEO of the startup, and I'm a person that is genuinely interested in all sorts of projects. Startup is a project, right? Yeah, everything is a project. I believe I've taken some of your project management courses and uh, everything which has a beginning has an end, a scope, time, budget, horizon, budget, a bit, yes. Yeah. Is a project. So yes, a startup is a very, very demanding project indeed. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, thanks for the opening the door for me to actually learn a little bit more about it and how does it look from purely project perspective and how you manage it. So in that regard, I have a couple of questions and I'll be very happy to hear your answer. So um, you're what, 10, 11 months into this startup Right exactly, now, 10 right? months, yeah. Very good. So I think that I, I assume you already have a lot of experience and many things became clear, clear to you. Uh, I'm sure that there is a certain gap between what you were expecting 10 months from your start and what it is, where, where it is now. Um, so tell me a little bit about the moment that you're in right now. Okay. So um, right now we have... 27,000 users. We're bringing this month. 27,000. 27, Three zeros. Yeah. 27,000 users. Good job for 10 months. Okay. Um, some of them are um, John Hopkins University, Yale University, EY, Maersk, Shift4, um, Charles Schwab. So we have decent clients. We have a lot of users. We are bringing in money. In January, we're, we brought in $25,000 in cash to the company from our operations and we're in a good place i would say um, so for us this becomes this um, point at which we have to decide um, are we going to make this small project a very big project um, or are we going to keep going at this you know healthy pace um, that we that we have been going at and the answer is can we get a big investment basically all right yeah so we are seriously considering fundraising and getting an investment of the size of several million dollars that we can inject into this project because we already know that the project is going well but when you're building product this is a very expensive activity it's an expensive type of project so to achieve you know better things we we need to increase the budget <laughs> Clearly. Very nice. Okay, so congratulations on all the great work done so far. Um, very nice, very nice. So going back to actually the project management field, um, you know, projects are developed in phases. Um, so the theory, of course, suggests that there are, you know, few few phases which are uh, very strict. But I have a suspicion that in startups, it can be a little bit different. They can flow, they can restart, and you know it's not that nicely ordered. Uh, you will tell me if I'm right, but my question basically is, uh, which phase do you think you're in right now? And which are the phases that you believe are already behind your back? And finally, probably, which is the next phase, something that you already hinted? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the very first phase of every startup project for me is this um, validation phase um, and many many people they, they focus on you know ideation and how I make this idea better and how do I think about it more and think more and think more but in fact the first phase is can you show that someone somewhere wants to buy whatever you're doing and this validation phase for us was three months 
Uh, we started with this Excel spreadsheet with an action backlog. I've taken it from you, by the way, this type of <laughs> yeah, right. organization. And we had about 30 activities that we needed to do. Everyone was, there were clear owners of the activities and people just had to do the job that was, you know, written over there. We had a, a team that was already working together. So this was um, very useful, but this was the first phase. Let's um, uh, write down a bunch of activities. Let's do the activities. And a let's backlog, as you say. Action backlog. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's. Does that make me a shareholder? W why? For the backlog that you got from me? Ah, uh, yes, of course. Okay. Um, uh, ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, listen, if if we become a unicorn, this will be, these ten dollars will return a thousand dollars. Okay, okay, I'm <laughs> I'm I'm so interested. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> okay. But uh, but yeah, so we started with this and uh, validation phase. Validation okay. phase, yeah. Simple express Excel spreadsheet. We got the job done. Now, is you're going forward. You we started. You need to introduce, you know, more rigid processes, more project management. As more people enter the project, it has to become a bit more rigid. But if you make it waterfally or you make it too rigid, you stop being a startup and things break in awful ways. So you have to be very, very flexible throughout the whole time. And uh, we've been actually th um, trying to figure out the best way for us to, to move and it's different for the product uh, department, it's different for the marketing department and so on. Um, for the for product and gener in general in startups, I really believe sprints are the best way to go about uh, in the pure agile sense, but not only. And some of my sprints are two weeks, some of my sprints are two months. And uh, for instance, uh, when we were building the product, we were trying to keep these sprints, you know, two, three weeks, then one week for fixing bugs, two, three weeks of new stuff, fixing bugs. You cannot plan too far ahead when you're validating or you're just out of validation, right? Absolutely. So you have, you, you, you have uh, uh, basically explained in uh, great details and, you know, in a great way, uh, the essence of this adaptive planning, basically. Okay. So you need to, you need to adapt uh, very early. Something very interesting that you said is that you uh, are flexible in your flexibility because mm. sprints generally should be you know equally sized time boxes and you see that you it actually works for you to customize also that right because it works better you have one that it makes more sense naturally due to the work to be a month or even longer and other ones that need to be uh, short sprints very good uh can you give one example yeah uh, because you mentioned that uh, you need to change direction every now and then mm -hmm. in product in uh, marketing um, any any example that you can give uh, to us about a change that you managed? So something that you were imagining to go and work in one way, uh, but you figured out that uh, you better change early on be be before you actually spend a lot of energy and efforts. I cannot give you a, uh, an example like this because we have planned for flexibility. And what we do uh, uh, did was... We have these strategy meetings, which are live in the office. It's one day, two days in which we plan uh, the future. We build a number of hypotheses and we start testing them one by one. And we do not commit to any one of them long term. So I, I cannot say that we mm -hmm. have decided to change direction. We have explored several options and we said this option sounds uh, most feasible, easiest to achieve, cheapest maybe at this point in time. And this is how we plan. And um, a, a lot of my job is to um, open different possibilities, op open and explore different um, future paths, right? And then uh, we get together with the team and we decide which path to take. So, yeah. Very good. So basically it sounds that you have found a very fine balance between on one side uh, exploring many options and not closing the door to any of them. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, not committing and not uh, making any costly mistakes so far. Uh, exactly. I remembered an example. So mm. we have this hypothesis that education is, uh, that um, distributing our software through education is going to be a winner. And we think that if we tailor, we have tailored our product somewhat for educational um, uh, 
um, institutions so they can build online courses inside the platform. This is a capability we do have. We have a landing page for it and I'm speaking to universities and I'm promoting it. For instance, with John Hopkins, we had a conversation about this, but they're very slow to move. So we stopped the development of this and we're waiting for the first of these clients to say, let's go. Mm -hmm. I have two or three people who are currently creating courses on uh, using our, you know, hidden feature. It's it's um, a, a private beta feature. You have to ask us and then we're mm -hmm. going to tell you about it. But I do not see immediate commercial uh, advantage to start, you know, investing into this more. Uh, more. Mm -hmm. But I think the market will get there. I think in half a year, in one year, this will become a feasible path for us and we're prepared for it. And uh, some people call it, we're setting up traps. Uh, that's that's how, uh, Katya from our team is saying this. So we have set up, you know, 10 of these. And there are things we're testing. If some if someone, you know, falls into this trap, yes, uh, we're going to commit some more. But uh, for now... Um, okay. Yeah. Very good. So the market is not ready. So this is an excellent example of how you need to basically prioritize your resources, considering that they are constraint even more so for a startup right mm -hmm. excellent very good um so okay you gave us a perspective of the validation so far that has been there um between validation and right now was there anything else that you can separate as a as a phase so i know it's not a sharp kind of uh, transition maybe scaling as i hear and the number that you have just quoted it sounds that you have had some scaling in between the validation and and today yeah, so uh, it's very visible on this cost graph that we have. Uh, uh, the different steps in the beginning, it's almost zero, the cost that we have. Then it goes to a one level, then to another level. So um, when you're scaling uh, a startup, you want to do this as slowly as possible. And uh, usually scaling is what breaks startups. And I believe every new team member should be properly onboarded and to, to achieve this, you have to hire one, two people every one, two months. And it is very important to increase your team because if you don't do it gradually, one year from now, if you have good success, you have to hire 10 people at once. And this breaks the teams because you didn't do the scaling gradually. Very nice. By the way, one, one quote that I really like about this one, uh, about the point that you're making of, uh, of slow scaling, uh, one of the worst things, uh, what is worse than having a 20% market share sometimes is having a 30% market share. <laughs> so I think that relates to, to, to your, your situation. Very good. Excellent. So maybe we can now focus on the moment right now that you're in. Okay. And w I think that you already have an idea what would be the next phase as you already hinted in the intro. Yeah. Um the fundraising. Yeah. So this is the top thing in your, you know, in your head as a, an entrepreneur right now. Yeah. Well, I've never raised money before. Uh, I have been bootstrapping all my life and self-funding the projects. Now, in November, I went to OpenAI Dev Day. I had a conversation with the OpenAI Startup Investment Fund. We're and talking about San Francisco, right? San Francisco. Yeah. Okay. In San Francisco. So this is the mecca of technology, Tec innovation, and AI. Exactly. Right now, right? Yeah, I spend 20... Good place to go. Okay. Yeah, 20 30% of my my days are spent there because it's inevitable. Uh, and over there, I was for the OpenAI conference, yearly conference. It was the biggest event in tech. Uh, it was an invite only, and I was one of the invitees. So I, I went there. The, later, I spoke to the OpenAI uh, Startup Investment Fund, and very soon after, I also spoke to Sequoia Capital and we had two meetings. Sequoia is one of the best funds in the world, most founder friendly. And um, we, we love Sequoia. All founders love Sequoia. So after these conversations, I understood that these people are genuinely interested in what we are building. And this shifted my, 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 my the way I was seeing the startup. And it told me maybe we can dream bigger and we can try to plan this for the next 10 years to plan it well, so on. First thing I did was educate myself. So 
I spoke to a couple of people that were well versed in this. I wrote, uh, I, I read uh, several books, uh, very important books, by the way, Venture Deals, uh, one of the most important books, um, Fundraising by Ryan uh, from uh, Bolt, he built Bolt, um, then uh, Angel by Kawakanis, and there are a bunch of other books we can put it in we the show notes. Just, yeah. just, just a, s- a second. So that's a very important point. So you're getting into something new, right? Another startup. Although you have experience as an entrepreneur, although you have experience from technical perspective uh, as a person very experienced and knowledgeable in the data science area, the AI. Um, now in this startup, you find a new thing that you're not uh, kind of prepared or knowledgeable enough about. Mm-hmm. And what you decide is actually to start learning about it, reading, educating yes. yourself, meeting the people that know this stuff so that you can level up and bridge the gap so that you are better in that. Uh, it's an interesting example that, you know, fundraising is not that common, but um, I think it's a very common thing that uh, entrepreneurs and startup early startup founders need to go through because it's very probable that you hit something that you have no idea how it's done, where it's going to be the marketing, the sales, the IT, if, you, if you're not an IT yes. person or whatever. And this up, upskilling uh, seems to be a very, very important thing for, for entrepreneurs, right? I think it's important for everybody to upskill all the time. But for us, it is mandatory. If we don't do it, we fail. Yeah. And um, the, the upskilling, it starts with the research phase. You have to research and you have to scope the problem. In IT, we call it, you have to climb the mountain, get to the top of the mountain, and then see, you know, uh, 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 the how next ma- peak. Yeah, the next peak. What is the next thing you, you need to do? So I read these books and based on them, I devised a strategy for this fundraising. And I realized many things. First, how long is this project going to be? You know, because I thought it's like, oh, I'm an amazing entrepreneur. I'll raise money quickly. But it's not like this. You know, you have to meet with enough people. They have to like you. You have to create the story, blah, blah, blah. Usually it takes between one and six months, most of the time, three, four months. So you have to plan for this time. I have to plan for this time that I will be away from the business, which is a very big issue. I'm uh, basically the, 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 the number one person in the business and I'll be away from the business because I'm fundraising. And this is a, a major thing you have to prepare for. Um, you have to prepare the whole organization for this absence. And why is it an absence? Well, because f- with fundraising, people have to meet me live. They cannot give me $5 million if they have a, uh, over Zoom. This is not how it works. So I need to be there. They need to meet me. Business will be without me. And okay. Sounds like you need a project manager. I am a project manager. Yes, and you're going away. <laughs> By the way, an interesting point. <laughs> Obviously, startups do, uh, cannot afford what uh, big companies do mm-hmm. right they have departments they can afford more people and they usually uh you know use the support of project managers in actually mm-hmm. managing various activities wow um so in your case you need to actually put many many hats on and i guess this goes also for your, some of your colleagues that yeah. they need to jump from one area to another and cover this this project management gap that also mm-hmm. happens in between the departments and also within the departments so I guess that's uh, another interesting thing that people cover. Yeah. Um, it's it's very hard to move from one type of project management to another. And I have really, uh, this is one of the, the struggles that we had. I was managing the project from beginning to end for many months. And then when we started preparing for these capabilities, we, we tried several different people to project manage the project and truth is in a startup they have to be ingrown it's very hard to get someone yeah. f- outside to manage your project so um, in the end we found you know the the formula for the mechanism project. yes yeah. but it took us six months and this is not you know trivial i was there i could support i could intervene if needed but in the next three months i will not be there yeah so i hope everything is Wonderful. Good. So tell us, lastly, uh, a little bit more about the fundraising. So what is your plan? So it sounds like a, a small project within your big startup right now. Oh, oh. You, you, uh, you, um, you put 
the start and kind of a target end date so you said about a six minutes six month period you're planning your resources so you need to need to be uh, you know you need to be away from your company uh, and kind of uh, give all the support that is needed so what will happen in these six months what is the plan okay um to to explain this better i just want to introduce an idea i wanted to say earlier in the start for, for the startup and for the sprints now creativity happens inside sprints and it is very important that um, I do not change the context too much throughout the sprint and for the next couple of months I will be a hundred percent for let's say 90 percent focused on the fundraising so I can dive really deeply into this topic and achieve the best possible result in our startup we are trying to make this happen not only for me but let's say for you quest the technical mind uh, behind uh, the app and everything you know 20 days of work without anyone interrupting someone who is very good at their work now with the fundraising what i'm doing is i'm fully devoted to the fundraising i'm spending most of the time doing this i have built three lists three excel spreadsheets one with a, one with founders other people who have done the same thing I spoke to 30, 40 of these founders in the past month and all of them gave me valuable insight from participatory knowledge. They were a part of the process. They know what happened. They know uh, the downsides and the upsides. They told me all of these things and I took, you know, the best ideas and uh, made them my own. So this is a wonderful example of something that we really value in project management. And this is lessons learned. Lessons so learned. So you are actually yes. consuming the lessons learned of oh, many people nice. that that yes. are so smart and experienced in that one, right? So this is the best thing that uh, anyone can do at the beginning of an initiative or or something that you're doing as a take the lessons project. learned. By the way, because of you, we are doing lessons learned after every sprint. We do the lessons learned and we pass them in the organization. But I've never thought about this that I'm stealing the lessons learned <laughs> exactly and actually this is this is one of the one of the reasons why I, I love this project management field because copying is allowed it's not illegal <laughs> no. how better can it get <laughs> oh. yeah okay yeah, but so back to back to your story so wonderful preparation so you're so good sucking out all the knowledge from practical people that have gone through that which yes. is the best way you're already preparing with the books that you um, mentioned before that so first books then founders yeah first theory then participatory knowledge from the founders and lessons learned <coughs> practical lessons learned then i have a list of champions people who will help me no matter what they i've proven myself in front of them they're my friends or past colleagues i uh, reach out to them and i tell them i'm embarking on this big project can you help me in, in some way yeah can you introduce me to someone can you review my documents or whatever and this is the second thing, asking help from people who can help you, right? And uh, are friendly. So this is the second list. I've been through these two. And the third list is the actual list of oh, four lists. Wow. Third list, angel investors. So these are usually people who invest small sums of money. Low risk, even if you don't do well, uh, it's okay. And I'm training, I'm experimenting, I'm uh, perfecting my pitch in front of these people. How many people have you pitched so far for the fundraising? 70, 100, I don't know, so far. And and none of them are actually, uh, not none, but very few are VCs, actual people that can give me $5 million. Because I was preparing, I was changing the words, I was changing the structure every time, every time. Does this land well? Does this roll off my tongue well? And I have reached a point at which I can tell the whole thing from beginning to end without even stopping and it will make absolute perfect sense for everybody. Wonderful. Experimenta experimentation. Yeah. And experimentation, testing, and you have also uh, gotten the feedback. feedback. Yeah. At every meeting I was asking, at the end, so I started meeting with, the agenda is the following. I pitch you, you give me advice and feedback on what you heard. This is how I was structuring this and I received so much feedback before that. Great job, Ilya, really. Okay, so it's a, a, a master masterpiece for preparation the way you you you're describing and, and everything that you have done so far and now it's execution time right now is the final step final step is the following um i have the pitch i have prepared the data room which is all the important stuff about the company that any investor could be interested in 
I have prepared all of these materials in advance and next week I'm embarking on this road show journey in which I will go and meet all of these people live. Now, I have already set up, you know, dozens of meetings in London, New York and San Francisco with people that I have spoken to in the past one, two months and I will go meet them live. For many of them, this will be the, the decision making meeting, right? I have to go impress them in real life so they want to work with, with me. It's a numbers game. This is very important to understand. If you don't knock on a hundred doors, you don't have a you don't have a chance. No matter how amazing you are, you have to knock on the doors. You have to to talk to the people. Sam Altman also talks to the people. He goes and meets them to get money. You know, um, you go, you explain you want what you want to do with the money. First, people want to feel special. This is very important. But second, you're marrying them. I have to also decide: Do I want to work with this person? Mm -hmm. And uh, I cannot decide this on via Zoom call. Many people can think that, okay, there is somebody that is becoming your sponsor and giving you the money, but that doesn't come uh, for free. Doesn't that means that the person free. becomes your partner moving forward with their requirements, their ideas, their expectations, right? And uh, it's a very good point that you're making. So you need to see that this, this would actually work uh, instead of actually ruining the dynamic going forward. So wonderful. Uh, I think this is a, a very, very critical moment. I wish you best of luck. Um, anything else that you want to add on this phase that you're actually yeah the, the, the last thing in? the last thing I want to say is statistic uh, there are many reasons why people want to invest in you for instance they just got a child they don't want to deal with you uh, they just invested they don't have money to invest in you their fund just ended they went on a vacation they can give you money in June but you need them now uh, so there are many reasons why they, they wouldn't invest so to get two, three people to want to invest in you, you have to meet with at least 30 people live. But to meet with 30 people live, you have to contact at least 100 people and pitch them online. It's a numbers game. And whoever is embarking on a project like this, uh, knock on as many doors as possible. It's about you creating opportunities and evaluating them one against the other. So uh, do, do it properly. Wonderful tips, wonderful tips. So thanks a lot, Ilya. So if I can summarize, your preparation for this mini project is now at the end and you're now stepping into the actual mm -hmm. uh, execution of all this uh, fundraising campaign, right? Yes, I will do this until the 30th of April. So I have uh, time boxed it for two months, March and April. I will be meeting with people, being there live. Uh, I'm hoping that the money will be in our account by June because there is some, you know, lawyer stuff going on. Uh, they need to check all the documents and everything. So realistically, in June, we would have received an investment from someone I met last month. Yeah. Then I met them live next month. And then the lawyers did it in May. Wonderful. And then in June, we get the money. Okay. Yeah. Great, Ilya. Best of luck. And uh, can we meet again in June then so that you can tell me all about it? Yeah, for my 30th birthday party, you're invited. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, Ilya. Is there anything that you want to ask me before we close the call? Yes. So, <laughs> the call. Uh, we've been, so I've known you for many years and I'm very excited about uh, the current moment the in your life that you're at. Um, you have done many things in your life. Most recently, you became project manager, project manager of the year. And um, you are actually, however, free for, for the last two weeks. You um, quit your job and you're now exploring something new. It's a new chapter in your life. I'm super excited about mm -hmm. it. And I want you to tell me a bit more about what are you planning? Where do you want to go? Uh, are you exploring opportunities or are you? do you have a strict plan? Yeah, very nice. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's see where I am. So I'm exactly, as you're saying, uh, two weeks out of a... Uh, you, you know, a long career streak of maybe 10 plus years, all related to project management. Um, so although I enjoy extremely uh, a lot working in a corporation, in a big environment, you know, with a lot of people buzzing around, um, the last years were a little bit heavy. Um, so I, I was looking for a moment maybe to try to explore something new, refresh myself a little bit. Um, and uh, this this moment came now. There were a couple of uh, 
reasons why uh, this was a good good moment to pick. So um, actually, my but my ten years were not just you know corporate you know project management heavy type of work. I was also uh, active on many additional. Um, um, additional activities related to, to project management. You're doing uh, consulting, weren't you? I have been doing point. consulting, helping companies structure their project management methodologies and you know implement better practices in their in their operations. I'm an author of an online course, a best-selling one on one of the uh, very big American platforms for 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 online education. Uh, I receive still excellent feedback for uh, from junior project management managers and people that want to get into the into the field. How many people have taken this course? Um, as of today, maybe close to to two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah. And the the what I really enjoy is that the the feedback and the overall rating is still on a very good place. That means that this is valuable for them. How many reviews do you know? I I cannot tell you. Sorry. It's usually about twenty percent of this. So about. Would be. Yeah, 40,000 reviews maybe? Possibly, I need to check. Um, so this is activities like that really uh, kind of um, excite me. Uh, and I actually want to do more because this has been one way or another uh, secondary activity in my life. And now I believe that uh, these need a chance. So I, if I give them a little bit more freedom and time and you know my, my focus, I guess that uh, they, they can interesting things could come out i'm actually sure about it and this is what i'm going to be exploring it's uh, i was thinking i'm going to take a pause and then i'm going to get into my new activity which is two or three things but uh, only one week after i actually quit my job i sat down at the computer uh, and i listed nine activities that i'm going to be working on now in parallel so i'm not going to be going through all of these but anyway just to give you the the feeling of, of what uh, what i have in front of me and this will be all related to project management and to projects yeah i was gonna ask so the overarching thing is project management yes it's it's so <laughs> uh, you're no longer a project manager but your passion is still project management interestingly enough yes so people usually get bored at a certain point but uh, project management is something that actually can uh, keep you up for quite a long time why it isn't it uh, an annoying activity where you have to nudge people to do stuff well, why project management? Of course, yeah. So uh, it depends on the person, on your background and your what the things that you like and the things that uh, get you crazy, right? So why project management? Um, there are a couple of reasons. Um, so first one is that people working in projects in general, not only the project managers, but people that are working in projects are working on non-repetitive type of work. So this is something that changes every few months. It can be three months, it can be six months, it can be 12 months. But, you know, every few months you actually change. You change the people, you change the type of activity, the topic, you know, the, the setting is different. We say that each project is unique. Even if you're building the exact same thing as a product, similar people, the fact that it's going to happen at a different time is enough to make the project different. Uh, you're going to face different problems. Um, so this non-repetitive uh, factor basically keeps you usually engaged. Unless you're a person that really likes to have everything well planned and uh, you, you don't want to have any, any uh, unknowns in your work. If you're, if you're not uh, uh, feeling well in dynamic environments where, where things might slip and change often, then it might not be a good place for you. So first one is non-repetitive non nature of work. Second one is the great exposure that you get with projects. You're usually not bound to a, one department and one set of people that you meet every day. You, uh, you work with different departments most of the time. So you can work with finance, with uh, production, with marketing, with sales, with the top management in a single project. So you can imagine the uh, amount of different stakeholders that you, that you will be facing, the amount of different points business of knowledge that you will be getting, exactly points of view that you need to also attract. And also the people. Uh, it's very common that in projects you meet people uh, from the top. So you meet the, t the top management and you need to present something to them or get something from them. You, you work with the middle management and you, you, you work with the entry level with the departments. And all these people have very different uh, needs, expectations from you. You have different, you know, expectations and needs from them. So that gives you this uh, um, amazing variety of, of people, people interaction. And uh, if you feel 
well working with people, then this is going to be charging you a lot. It's going to be charging a lot your batteries and keep you in the job. Mm. Uh, another factor is, uh, from career perspective, project management gives you an open door to early, uh, early management. So early in your career, you can exper experiment and actually practice management because project management is a branch of the management mm. uh, subject. Um, another factor is uh, salary. So generally, this is a, a well-paid job that uh, is, uh, you know, uh, levels that you would get many years later. So this is something neat. And this comes from the demand, obviously. Mm. Special skills are needed to uh, solve these special problems. Can you tell me about the demand? You, you said demand. This is this is very fundamental. First thing you learn in economic school is supply and demand. And you're right. The salaries are high because of the demand. And yeah, where is the demand? Everywhere, so is it? It is, yeah, everywhere, basically, still very strong. Um, the economy is moving more into a projectized setup. Okay. So organizations, big mundane organizations, which were very strict, you know, in their departmental uh, structures were, you know, not exploring that much. And now they understood the need of being more flexible, being able to uh, be faster in your operations, in your sales, uh, and all, all the other departments mm. new systems are coming so change is getting faster and faster and to manage it you need uh, a solid project management uh, capability in our field we see that uh, everything is accelerating and everything is happening faster uh, across every field and what you're saying is to manage this uh, accelerating you know environment you need better people to manage the projects Yes, and, and skills. Better so you, 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 you can teach these skills to anybody. It's not needed that you have a project manager. You, you can teach the project management skills to, to, to your organization. And that helps a lot. And uh, you're saying acceleration is key. Acceleration means time. Yeah. And the managers of time are usually the project managers. Okay. So this is where, where, the, where, where, where this um, demand comes from. By the way, uh, 2017 or 18, there was a very detailed study by PMI, which was trying to project uh, what would be the demand for project management in the decade to come. So I cannot quote you the exact numbers, but um, the annual growth uh, was something like 15 to 20 percent, expecting more than a million additional uh, project managers to be needed on the job market by 27. Now we are five years into that. And the numbers actually prove it. So the curve is really steep and it's going in that direction. Uh, so that's the, that's, the, that's the demand topic. But a few more things I wanted to add. Um, another thing is the low barrier to entry for this job. So you don't need to be a, you know, a doctor where you need to f work for, um, study for five years, practice for another five years to get it. Even uh, a person working in finance or accounting or, or IT, you, know, you need many, many years. Uh, the, the barriers to entry for project managers are relatively low. So you can get an online course in a few weeks. You can have a basic knowledge that may be enough. And if you are a good fit for a, with your background, of course, if your background is good enough for that, it's quite probable that you can land on an entry level project management job. So this is also something that is uh, contributing to that. Okay, so we have a, a very, very big demand for this job. And what you're saying is that to meet this demand, we need a higher supply of project managers, but this is not a problem because they can easily upskill, people can easily become project managers and get into this high paid job where, um, which you claim is very high, is highly interesting as well uh, and yes. always changing, yeah. Well, yes, and that that may also explain the, the, the curves that we're seeing. Uh, but we need to be careful here because project manager can mean many things. So uh, a pro there can be two people with the title project manager. One can be somebody with one year experience into the job, working in a maybe one dimension um, field. Another one can have the project manager role and be able to run a huge company. And okay. I, I, have, I have seen both cases where one of the project managers was actually promoted to run a company, a factory recently. So, um, from okay. project manager, then there is a big curve 
uh, going forward. And here we're talking about senior, senior project managers. And this is the topic that actually I wanna address. Because um, the foundation for getting into project management is excellent. We have many institutions that are providing certifications and education. They're all very good. Uh, from standard one, traditional ones to agile uh, and across. But what happens then, a little bit later, so when you are already a few years into project management, you're all well certifi certified, and you start, you know, bring, um, uh, gaining seniority. And this is the place that is not structured at all yet on the, on the market. And this is something that needs more and a different type of uh, education, learning, and mm, content content creation. Um, so here, basically, um, mm, with uh, with a group of very very high profile project managers, uh, we are preparing this place where the uh, advanced topic will be also addressed. So people that want to actually excel, uh, learn more about different types of projects, they can be excellent in one field. They want to actually learn a little bit more about the other fields because, let's face it, each project management manager grows from, from one basket. Mm -hmm. And you need to start learning the rest. You need to start learning the advanced topics to get even better, to get, to get uh, closer to the point of this second project manager that I told you who, like that, can uh, be promoted to run the company. So yeah. you want to bring this seniority. And we see people stay in project manager f management for many years. And it's not that they're doing exactly the same. They're actually growing a lot. And I would really like to help them structure this advanced piece of their knowledge, help them gain confidence that they are actually getting to this advanced stage. Uh, they, they know how to manage many things, complex projects, programs, high risk, high strategy initiatives that sometimes even the CEO wouldn't uh, be able to actually execute. And this is a very, very precious uh, uh, skill set that people need to cultivate. They have it, but you need to work on this experience and knowledge to actually cultivate it into this seniority. So in, uh, in, in startups, we call this, um, this is the problem you're solving in inside this whole project management field. You have picked a, a, a niche which is underserved, which is project managers who are senior. They want to excel. They want to upskill in different uh, places so they can be you know, the best um, possible version of themselves. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And, but how to do that? You cannot do it. Uh, Is easily. there a place where you can do it? Yes. So this will be available at uh, pmpeer.com where you can ha have your uh, your PM Who need? peer uh, <laughs> to actually help you, talk to you, w uh, see what content you can actually consume there and actually uh, grow. Um, and this content will be created by high profile project managers, people with very heavy experience in the field who will be able to give it uh, created, create professional and high quality content, uh, relevant content, and also engaging content. So I, I believe that this will be a very interesting place for any project manager to uh, spend more time going forward. Very interesting. Thank you for sh for sharing this. I knew a bit about it before, but I'm very excited about uh, this future project, pmpeer.com. Um, and I think I'm an experienced project manager and I'm very excited to see what you prepare there and how I can become better at uh, managing bigger projects. Yes. And actually your experience will actually also help structure such projects. So it will be, uh, you know, a two-way two -way conversation. But anyway, just last thing to say is that uh, uh, we are preparing things that have not yet been done for project managers. So it will be very interesting. Stay tuned. Exciting. Thank you so much for uh, joining the Data Room podcast. <laughs> it and was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you.